I'm Tomas. Uh, I'm Expo co-chair alongside Nabil. So the next talk is going to be about a very challenging and interesting topic, which is adoption. It's going to be presented by Taratan, uh, who is Venture Studio Lead at, uh, uh, at the Ideal Collabs, and also uh, Elias Simons, who is a Senior Research Analyst at the Central Park Capital. Please join me and welcome the great speakers. Hi, everyone. Can you guys hear us, hear us OK? All right, well, um, if uh, there's no objection to sound, we'll just get started. Um, so we're really excited to join you over video uh, to share the state of adoption report. Fun fact, Elias and I have not actually met in person yet. <laughs> Although we've been working True together story. for about six <laughs> months. So this is uh, a pretty meta remote presentation. Um, but we're, we're really excited to share um, sort of what we've learned so far. Uh, we talked about six months ago and wanted to do a really quick survey of, you know, what has happened in 2019 in the crypto ecosystem. You know, what has changed, what hasn't changed. And while we were working on this report, we realized that it, as sort of a collaborative view, uh, bringing in together uh, different and diverse perspectives from, you know, sort of VCs, analysts, and startup founders would sort of make this a, a much more interesting and dynamic report. So this is what we did. We roped in about a dozen of our favorite sort of um, other collaborators in, in, um, in VC, uh, startup founders, and uh, sort of came up with a quick survey of, of what we, we have today. So maybe just to start, a little bit about us. Uh, Elias, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, hey, everybody. Um, I'm Elias. I, uh, I basically re lead uh, research at a multi-strategy crypto asset fund called Decentral Park uh, Capital. Um, and in the past, I've been uh, an entrepreneur in residence and uh, helped the strategy uh, and so on in various uh, startups and, and corporates. And my sort of academic background is in, in management and behavioral science uh, at LSE in London. Very cool. Uh, and my name is Tara. I'm an investor at IDEO Colab Ventures. Um, our Twitter account is at IDEO VC if you'd like to follow us. I have a design and product background. Um, I've led design and product at several startups um, and you know, have been working actively in the Bitcoin, uh, sort of in the crypto space uh, ever since joining IDEO about five years ago. Um, and really excited to be here and sort of really share uh, what we've been working on. So just kicking us off, uh, you can check out our full report in all its glory, all 150 pages of it at stateofcrypto.report. Uh, there you, you'll be able to look at the report, download it, and even jump into a Telegram chat where we've been discussing the research, uh, sort of talking through different data points and slides. So everyone's welcome to join. Uh, feel free to, to, to take a look. Um, but for today, we're, we're hopefully giving you just a quick high-level overview um, of what we think was most interesting um, about the report. So this is a pretty, you know, sort of condensed version, um, sort of a teaser, as you will, to see, to see uh, the full report in, in all its glory. So starting, starting off with uh, sort of a quick overview of uh, the system, uh, the ecosystem itself. Um, in 2019, we found that Bitcoin gained mainstream mindshare as a store of value asset uh, on par with, with major global currencies. Um, sort of looking at you know, global web search trends, um, social media, I think even different mentions on uh, various Netflix TV shows like Ultra Carbon, um, Bitcoin you know, increasingly being referred as a store of value or digital gold has really captured uh, sort of mainstream mindshare and, it's, and excitement around it. Um, it's, but you know, still, however, if you still compare it uh, uh, on a whole, uh, the correlation is still inconclusive. I think what we're seeing is that, you know, while there is sort of more um, uh, sort of mainstream understanding and mind share of Bitcoin, uh, the price still is incorrelated with, with uh, sort of the fear index or the VIX. So quickly looking through it, uh, Ethereum still remains the leader in smart contract platforms in terms of market share, as well as uh, applications being developed on top of it. Uh, which is pretty cool compared to others like EOS, uh, Tron, or Cardano. Um, and what we found is that the few end users that we have are, are mainly spread across three chains, and that is uh, ETH, EOS, and Tron. Um, I think we're looking at, if you're looking at daily active users, um, you know, it's about 65,000 plus or minus, and we took that snapshot 
in uh, December 2019. Uh, this is a pretty cool sort of um, uh, little overview of, of what it, you know, what is being developed in the space, I believe with, um, if you go back to the slide, previous slide, Elias, um, you know, with about three to 4,000 dApps um, across uh, the main smart contract platforms, uh, 65,000 users and about, you know, so about 15,000 smart contracts um, online. So here's just to say that, you know, while uh, it feels like we've been sort of in the trenches and seen many sort of cycles along the way, crypto is still maturing, uh, but it's still very, very early days. So this is the time to sort of really hunker down um, and experiment um, and really try out, you know, sort of really crazy and wild ideas while we're at this space. Thank you, Tara. That's cool. So yeah, so jumping into uh, what it looks like in terms of so developer growth and uh, uh, interest in, in the ecosystem. Um, in 2019, we've actually seen that uh, developer growth has actually stalled. Um, historically, it's always sort of, uh, you know, sort of somewhat lagged or, or lagged price. Um, but what we've seen is that uh, we're hoping for more developers to come in uh, and be active contributors into the space. Um, you know, Ethereum and Bitcoin attract the most developers by a margin. Uh, that's pretty clear. I think monthly active Ethereum developers uh, range about a thousand plus or a thousand two hundred, um, which is which is kind of cool. Um, and uh, but, however, overall, there's still a ton of room for growth. If we're looking at about you know you know sort of seven thousand act monthly active crypto developers in this space. Uh, and you compare it to developers in sort of the Web2 space, you know, we're definitely an order of magnitude behind. So, you know, what we're, for this ecosystem to really flourish, I think we need lots of great talent to come into the space uh, to build and to experiment um, together. So I think that's the, the next chasm that we're uh, hoping to cross. Super. Thanks, Tara. Um, so moving on to DeFi, if, you, if you've been around for, uh, uh, for 2019, you've probably kind of caught wind of DeFi being one of the major trends when it comes to uh, user adoption and probably one of the more interesting sort of hotbeds of, of innovation in, in this space. Uh, DeFi is shorthand for decentralized finance and basically refers to a collection of, of protocols and services that replicate legacy uh, finance uh, blocks with, with code and software. Uh, the majority of that activity is, is built uh, and, and based on Ethereum. And the rise of DeFi over, over 2019 also kind of queued in uh, a new era for Ethereum itself uh, and a transition from a fundraising tool and a capital formation tool back in, in 2017 and the ICO era into a settlement layer for uh, open finance and DeFi. And you know, we, we went out and, and measured that by looking at you know, social mentions of ICOs versus DeFi and uh, money sort of absorbed by DeFi versus money uh, and value raised uh, in, in ICOs. And you know, just looking at these two, it, it, it becomes pretty evident that you know, we're still, uh, still pretty uh, early days. Um, still, even at this sort of early stage, there's more than 150 organizations that operate uh, within DeFi and around DeFi at the protocol level or, or peripheral um, to that. And the, the value proposition of, of these organizations and, and, and these protocols is that uh, they're uh, programmable, they are composable, uh, one protocol and, and, and piece of software can reference the state from, from another piece of software um, uh, freely and, and build and create value uh, 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 to augment kind of the, uh, uh, the value of the whole. Um, but also, uh, uh, what's what's really important to note here is that you know the marginal cost of, of producing an extra unit of service for uh, uh, for, for potential uh, users is uh, much lower than it is uh, in in legacy finance, and uh, that has huge implications when extrapolated um, to scale. Um, uh, DeFi is growing is growing fast. Uh, one one of the ways we uh, that's that's being measured is how much ETH. Uh, is, is being used as collateral within DeFi. Um, and uh, by that, Maker and Compound, which uh, are a lending facility in the money market uh, protocol, uh, have led the way over 2019. But also uh, uh, beneath those, we, we, we saw uh, the rise of, of different uh, protocols to 
provide different service for uh, different use cases like uh, uh, Uniswap, which is a, uh, an automated market maker, Nexus Mutual, which is an insurance uh, protocol, DYDX for derivatives and, and so on. Um, over 2019, we also saw about 225,000 unique addresses interact with DeFi. Um, but what's interesting is that less than 4% of those interacted with more than one protocol. Uh, so it, it seems like it's still pretty uh, daunting for users to uh, to use the full gamut of, of services and, and possible value that uh, DeFi offers. And that's, uh, you know, equally a, a, bill, a big a bottleneck, but also a big uh, opportunity. Um, and also when we looked at uh, who provides that capital for, you know, lending and, and derivatives and... Uh, most of the services that uh, that run on DeFi, it looks as if it's actually uh, quite concentrated. So there's about 30 entities that provide 50% uh, of the capital for Compound, and there's uh, the equivalent figure for MakerDAO is at 150. Um, now, is, is that a bad thing? Is that a good thing? I don't really know. I know that uh, power laws exist everywhere. Uh, specifically more so in, in money and money-related uh, uh, spaces. Um, and so while I'm not necessarily expecting this to change, I am expecting the uh, magnitude in the y-axis to change over the, the next year or, or two. Um, and finally, within DeFi, uh, DAI, which is the stablecoin that's the derivative of, of the MakerDAO uh, contract, um, has, has a, a big role to play. And uh, what's really interesting about DAI and what, what really piqued our interest in 2019 was all the experiments that we saw with DAI's uh, utility and uh, what, what are known as wrapper tokens. So wrapper tokens are basically money uh, without opportunity cost. You can think of them as you know, uh, a $10 bill in your, in your wallet. And what that $10 bill does is uh, that it provides you with the ability to access services and value in the world around you of up to $10 uh, worth. Uh, but while it's in your wallet, it's not doing much uh, else, right? It's just, it's just dead weight loss. But what if um, that $10 bill could be earning interest while it's in your wallet? And what if it could also help you hedge your uh, exchange rate risk on, on other currencies? Or what if it could uh, participate in a lottery at the same time as it's in your wallet and it's ready uh, to be deployed. So a lot to be excited about uh, within DeFi, but also a lot of risks and, and opportunities. Um, also, 2019 was a pretty uh, interesting year with regards to uh, token economics as a, as a concept overall. I think if we, if we zoom out enough, um, we can describe uh, what's going on in, in the token economic space with a simple enough equation, which is users times uh, token economics equals uh, value. So you can have uh, one without the other, but then that that's not going to lead to uh, value accrual. I don't know that value accrual is something that every protocol or every token-based system should aspire to, um, but if that's what the token system and and uh, ecosystem aspires to, then that's something to, uh, to take in mind. So over 2019, we saw burn and mint tokens uh, show promise. Uh, burn and mint tokens are basically encapsulating the idea that you mint uh, tokens as useful work takes place uh, on the network, and you burn uh, tokens uh, as uh, resources are, are, are demanded in the network. And so at maturity, you can imagine that uh, this creates a deflationary uh, uh, situation and that kind of helps uh, value to accrue. And we had pretty interesting empirical sort of evidence that this actually might uh, work over 2019. At the same time, um, there were a lot of attempts into uh, valuing uh, these tokens and work tokens uh, are, you know, the taxi medallion model that lends itself to uh, different valuation models from the legacy finance world, like the discounted cash flows. Uh, approach. And while uh, they have done really well in the private markets, we haven't yet seen them uh, uh, perform 
commensurately in, in the public markets. And that's possibly something to change as uh, sort of their uh, value proposition uh, increases with more and more features being delivered. Um, governance is a feature, uh, but not yet the driver of value, equivalently with, with work tokens. And I think over 2019, we uh, pretty uh, uh, convincingly uh, got evidence that uh, pure payment utility tokens don't work um, just because, at least in my view, the alternative is, is really compelling, and that's you know, the US dollar and, and possibly fiat money. Um, and kind of as a, as a closing section before, before I hand off back to, uh, to Tara, there's, there's um, a couple of points that uh, I think really uh, came across from, from our research uh, regarding decentralization. Decentralization is, a, you know, is, is what this industry aspires to uh, and for good reason and comes with all kinds of benefits. Um, but uh, the question mark there is alluding to the fact that we need to be realistic about uh, how decentralized uh, things are and that you know there are centralized pockets in this industry and often they're not so easy to uh, uh, to pick out. Uh, and one of those, one of the more interesting examples um, was uh, validator ecosystem and proof of stake uh, networks. And we, we observed that these ecosystems become more uh, centralized. So validators have more of the stake uh, available in the network as they grow as they grow in a number of nodes and as time passes and so on. And that's uh, something in a way to be expected because of the way these networks have been designed. Early participants get compensated for the risk that they take and enjoy the compounding advantages of, you know, being understanding what it takes to operate uh, such a, uh, a business or an operation or uh, having the reputational advantages that come with kind of, you know, performing over a long period of time. But when you overlay uh, coin voting and on-chain governance on top of that, this has possibly adverse um, implications. Uh, another interesting sort of pocket of centralization that, uh, that came up uh, through, through our research was uh, in exchanges. So at the moment, uh, about 10% of all the Bitcoin in circulation uh, lives in exchange wallets. And uh, similarly, uh, I think for Ethereum, the figure is, is around 8% of all Ethereum in circulation. But you know, as, as Ethereum moves to proof of stake, then sort of the, the economic, the, the power to generate sort of economic bandwidth in ETH moves from proof of work miners to uh, uh, proof of stake validators. And exchanges are one of the biggest pool and a totally new stakeholder to, uh, to enter this game and they what we saw in 2019 was that you know exchanges uh, can be both uh, positive actors in an ecosystem like that but also negative actors um, and you know a, a, an example of positive involvement of an exchange in a in a proof of stake uh, network uh, was was Coinbase's involvement in uh, in Tezos over 2019 they launched support uh, and, and build technology on top of uh, on top of Tezos to be able to kind of serve it uh, to their customers. Um, but then on the other hand, we also saw um, uh, attempts to usurp uh, network governance. Uh, one older example uh, uh, was Huobi, uh, a very well-known Chinese exchange, um, colluding on EOS's uh, delegated proof of stake. Um, in order to uh, uh, exchange votes with other block producers and, and basically control uh, the large part of, of how governance is executed. But also more recently, kind of the proxy vote uh, situation with multiple exchanges, proxy voting, uh, signaling effectively uh, the steam holdings in order to uh, basically un, uh, uh, unseat the 21 block producers uh, that were active in Steam. So um, over to Tara. Yeah, thanks a lot. That was super interesting. I love the, the, the sort of the flyby section in token economics. And um, I think when I first saw that data point around the amount of BTC that was under, under custody and exchanges, I was, it, just, it just blew my mind. I was like, wow, I guess we don't even think about that, right? But um, uh, I think that was super fascinating. So thank you for sharing. 
so, so where do we go from here? I mean, you know, we saw sort of the the amount of experimentation and the innovation that was happening in 2019. Um, and I think we came to sort of this, this insight that, you know, if 2019 was about infrastructure development, um, in 2020, we, we need to we need to be the year where the industry must prove that it can attract more users and bring more, more users on board. Um, just a quick snapshot of, of what it looks like in the space. I think Block Native had this really interesting data point where, uh, you know, across the entire uh, blockchain ecosystem, that means every single chain out there, as a, as a crypto ecosystem, we processed about 1.1 billion transactions in 2019 alone. Well, that number is not not small. I think it's uh, you know what's for context. Visa processes about 150 million transactions every single day. So as you can see, we're still very much an order of magnitude behind. If you look at number of users on uh, Web two versus Web three applications, I think we have about you know obviously about 20 million global Coinbase users compared to about 254 million global PayPal users. Uh, if you look at the number of browser sort of downloads for Brave, it's about 10 million. And that's, you know, a very a small fraction of the uh, billion active Chrome users uh, that we have online today. So this is a good time to sort of huddle up uh, and build infrastructure. But then we have to start looking at uh, crossing the chasm to bringing more users on board. So thank you for the full report. Visit stateofcrypto.report. And if you're building anything cool or, you know, you want to discuss a data point, or you want to share sort of, or, or you know, sort of discuss uh, any, any new ideas you have, feel free to reach out to us. You can reach out to us through the website or join us on the Telegram chat. Thanks everybody. I think um, we hope you enjoyed this presentation. Um, we also welcome anybody that wants to uh, contribute in future research to, uh, to get in touch. We're excited to, uh, to talk to you. And I think now we have, we have uh, a few minutes to open up to, uh, to questions for, uh, for the audience. Thanks, Elias. Thanks, Tara. <laughs> we, have, uh, we have time for a couple of questions. So please line up on the microphone. Uh, yeah, I have a question for, uh, I guess, Elias's presentation on slides 24 and 25. You're showing the... Uh, the burn and mint coins. Yeah. What, yep. What's the y-axis on these graphs? Is this a relative, you know, like a multiplication uh, normalized to the start date or price or what? It's it's the performance of the relative return of a uh, you know if you bought this asset uh, on January first, twenty nineteen. How would it how would it have performed? Uh, so, so, so it's on the index to price then, basis. not market cap or yes price. Yes. Okay. Index Thank to you. Price. Oh, by the way, where can I get these slides? Can I download these or something? From the you can go to uh, stateofcrypto.report. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Any more questions? Yeah, I think that we are done. So thanks once again, Tarin Elias. Phyllis, let's do it. How does it pop up?